Hello. I'm Gina Vild. I'm the Associate Dean for Communications and External Relations and Chief Communications Officer at Harvard Medical School. And I'm thrilled to welcome you here tonight. And I'm also thrilled to welcome all of you who are watching us from your computer or your mobile app, since we are live streaming the Longwood Seminar for the first time this year. So please tell your friends and your colleagues who may not be able to attend the next two seminars that we will also be live streaming. And it's especially nice to know that you braved the sleet and the snow to be with us. So thank you. That shows tremendous dedication and interest in our program. Tomorrow is the first day of spring. So we're hoping that the next two seminars will bring with them better weather and that you could join us for those. So the next seminars are It's All in Your Head, Building Better Brains Through Neuroengineering, which will be held on April 2nd and Beyond Belief, Exploring the Connection Between Personal Beliefs and Physical Health will be on April 23rd. Tonight's seminar is called The Power of Z's, Uncovering Why Sleep is Essential to Our Well-Being and How to Get More of It. Here are some little known facts about sleep. Staying awake for 24 hours leads to cognitive impairment equal to a blood alcohol level of 0.10 when you consider that being legally drunk is 0.08, that's pretty serious. While you may know that 39 states have made it illegal to text and drive, you may not know that one state, New Jersey, has made it illegal to drive while drowsy, and more states may follow suit. 250,000 people fall asleep at the wheel every day in this country. Did you know that sleep deprivation that begins at age 50 has been linked with risk of early onset dementia? And did you know that a lack of sleep can generate wrinkles through the release of extra cortisol known as the stress hormone? Too much cortisol breaks the collagen and your breaks down the collagen in your skin. I read last week's New York Times magazine and it may have also caught your attention. The article reported on a new study that suggests losing even a few hours of sleep a few nights in a row can lead to immediate weight gain. And did you know that if you are sleep deprived and if you diet to lose weight, your efforts are unlikely to be successful because you'll tend to lose muscle, not fat. So to shed light on this topic, and on the problems of sleep deprivation, we're fortunate to have with us tonight internationally known experts from Harvard, from Harvard Medical School, who will help us understand the science behind sleep. And hopefully, who will also share with us their insight on how we can develop a healthy sleep routine. But first, just a few announcements. Please be aware that we will be videotaping this program, and those of you in the first few rows may appear on the video. If you would like supplemental reading material, we urge you to look online at our website. If you do not have a computer, please visit the Boston Public Library, and our staff in the back can offer you those locations. You likely know that if you attend three of the four seminars, you'll receive a certificate of completion for the 2013 series. And of course, teachers can earn professional development credits by attending all four seminars. And for more detail on how you, can, how you can get those points, please see our staff in the back. We're also happy to share that the Longwood Seminar continues to evolve electronically, as does the world. And we now have our own mobile app. We invite you to download it on our website. You can get a schedule of the, pro, of the future seminars. You can get all of the supplemental reading material and our location. We will also be live tweeting tonight. If you would like to live tweet with us, you can participate in the conversation by using hashtag HMS Minimed. We also are encouraging you to ask questions. We were handing out index cards at the registration desk. We will have staff collecting these cards, so please pass your questions to our staff. And then finally, of course, as a courtesy to our speakers, turn off your phone. Now allow me to introduce tonight's honored speakers. First, Dr. Susan Redline is the Peter C. Farrell Professor of Sleep Medicine at Harvard Medical School and Brigham and Women's Hospital. 
She directs programs in sleep and cardiovascular medicine and sleep medicine epidemiology at Brigham and Women's Hospital and at the Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital. Dr. Stuart Kwan is the Gerald E. McGinnis Professor of Sleep Medicine at Harvard Medical School and Brigham and Women's Hospital. He is also the editor of the Sleep and Health Program at Harvard Medical School's Division of Sleep Medicine. And first you'll hear from Dr. Elizabeth Clerman, who is an Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and Brigham and Women's Hospital. Thank you for joining us and thank you to our speakers. So good evening, I wanna thank you all for coming and talking and listening to us talk about sleep. And um, I just want to start off by saying, as she said, there's gonna be three of us speaking. I'm gonna first talk about sleep, that thing you don't get. And I just wanna say that I expect, as I look out here, that several of you will fall asleep while I'm talking. <laughs> Dr. Redline will talk about common sleep problems and disorders, risk factors, presentations, and consequences. And then Dr. Stuart Kwan will talk about, do you have a sleep disorder and what to do about it? So, Due to copyright reasons, I couldn't put up a picture that's one of my favorite pictures about sleep, that thing you don't get, to emphasize the fact that sleep is a biological need and you tend to get it whether or not you want to go into it or not. And one of my favorite pictures is that of Larry Summers asleep at a, at a meeting with President Obama, a cabinet meeting. He's two seated two people down from Obama and he's there asleep. You would think that he knows how to stay awake. You would think that he would be motivated to stay awake. And there was also a photographer in the room, and yet there he is asleep. And here's this poor man sleeping on the subway or some commuter because he hasn't gotten enough sleep and he can't stay awake, even in a public place. This is a great quote from Alan Rechschaffen, who's one of the founders of the field of sleep medicine, who said, if sleep does not serve an absolutely vital function, it's the biggest mistake evolution has ever made. Here you are immobile for hopefully eight hours a night, you're not eating, you're not foraging, you're, not you're certainly not defending yourself, and you're not propagating the species, to put it in a G-rated way. And so sleep, in some ways, is either a huge evolutionary mistake or something is happening, and I'm gonna tr all of us are going to try and convince you that you need more sleep probably than you're actually getting. So you're going to see another version of this with late, one of the later uh, talks, but this is a standard sl scale. And I just think about how likely you're going to fall asleep during any of these. Uh, sitting and reading, watching TV, sitting and active in a public place like right here, being a passenger in a motor vehicle, lying down, sitting and talking, sitting quietly after lunch. After I gave this talk a couple years ago, somebody walked up to me and said, I fall asleep at red lights, is that okay? And I said, no, it's not okay. So um, that's the answer, stop for a few minutes in traffic while driving. So what is sleep? What are the criteria that we use for deciding what sleep is? It's reversible, mercifully. Um, it's behavioral, so it's quiet. Behavioral qui qui quiescence, it's quiet. It's not the same thing as a coma, and it's not the same thing as anesthesia. When an anesthesiologist quotes and quotes puts you to sleep, it's not the same thing. They're very different things. It's associated with an increased arousal threshold. It's harder, things that when you're asleep, a stimulus that you might respond to, you don't respond to. And indeed, that changes dramatically over age. If you've ever had a three to five year old, they can fall asleep in the car, you can pick them up, you can put on their pajamas, and you can put them into bed. That's a very different arousal threshold because when they're awake, they're up and all running around with all the stimuli. It's regulated by this homeostatic mechanism, which is your ability, how quickly you fall asleep and how deeply you sleep depends on how long you've been awake. It's as if it's regulating how much sleep you've had and how much you need. And if you've had extended wake, you're more likely to fall asleep and you're more likely to sleep longer. And it's also what's called consolidated by this circadian clock. So you have an internal clock in your brain that governs what time of day it is, that keeps track within your brain what time of day it is. And for almost all species, the circadian clock influences the time when you sleep and the kind of sleep you have, whether you're a nocturnal animal, in which case the clock is regulating that you should sleep during the day and be active at night, or you're a diurnal animal, or you're a cat who sleeps all the time or is only active at dawn or dusk. So characteristics of sleep. It's ubiquitous. Every animal that we know of has it. Mammals, insects, they all have sleep. And there are great pictures on the web of an animals of all kinds sleeping. It's obligatory. Somebody had to do this experiment. It has not been repeated, but they sleep-deprived rats, and eventually they died. Once again, this hasn't been repeated, but it 
For some reasons, it had to be done once. It's complex. There's actual multiple types of sleep. When you're, somebody's asleep, there's two types. There's rapid eye movement sleep, which if you look at somebody, you can see their eyelids move, uh, their eyes moving below their eyelids, and they tend to be relatively still. And then there's non-rapid eye movement sleep, which is a different type of sleep. But that's all within the time when somebody looks like they're lying still. As I said before, it's homeostatically regulated. The timing and type of sleep depends on how long you've been awake. And if you don't get enough, things happen. You, performance and alertness are affected. As she said, you can have traffic accidents um, and other things, as Dr. Redline and Dr. Kwan will talk about, other matters of physiology are definitely affected. And sleep disorders exist. Just like there's cardiovascular medicine or endocrinology, there's sleep disorders medicine. And there are many different kinds of sleep disorders, and there's now uh, better, better ways to actually treat them. So how do we record sleep? We record sleep most of the time using what's called polysomnography. So poly meaning multiple, somno meaning sleep, and graphy meaning some sort of recording. And the way you do this is you monitor somebody's eye movements, their brain waves, and their muscle tone. Just think what happens if you ever see somebody falling asleep. Their eyes roll up into their heads, or as I just described, if you're having rapid eye movement sleep, you have rapid eye movements. Their brain waves change because their responsiveness to stimuli has changed, and their muscle tone relaxes. They fall like this. I was once interviewing a man who worked in a prison for a drug company study, and he said they call it breaking your neck. And I sort of went, shuddered. I thought he meant like the death penalty. And he went, no, when you fall asleep, you, you know, your neck falls forward. But that's how we record the kinds of sleep people are in. We record their brain waves, we record their eye movements, and we record their muscle tone. And there are different stages of sleep, and they look, they look different. I don't know how else to put it. There's this stage one, which is where if I woke you up, you told me that you wouldn't be asleep. This is when you run over the rumble strip on the road. You think you're really awake, but you're not. And it has this sort of mixed frequency high. This is stage two, which has these characteristic things like this, and then these things called K-complexes. And stages three and four are the deepest stages of sleep. This is when it's hardest to wake you up, and they have these big, slow waves. And then rapid eye movement sleep actually is called paradoxical sleep in some species, because except for the muscle tone, when you're very still, um, it looks like you're awake. There's rapid eye movements, and the brain waves mostly look like you're awake. And then across the night, there's these pa characteristic patterns across the night where if you think of your, start off when you're awake, and you think of, as I said, non-REM stages three and four, which have now been combined into one stage, um, are the deepest stages of sleep. You tend to have deeper stages of sleep early in the night, and then shallower stages of sleep and more rapid eye movement sleep at the end of the night. So how is sleep regulated? There are two systems, as I mentioned before. There's this sleep homeostasis, how long have you been awake and how long you've been asleep. And then there's the circadian approximately 24-hour clock. And how do you know when these two systems are out of sync? If you have to work the night shift. You're now trying to work at a time when your body wants you to be asleep. You may have been awake for a longer period of time, and you're having problems staying awake. This is a real problem for millions of people who have to work the night shift. As I just said, the homeostatic regulation is very different when you're working the night shift, because if you're working during the day, you usually wake up and you get to work within a few hours. But people working the night shift tend to wake up at, still wake up sort of mid, late morning, early night, and then go to, go to work eight to 10 hours later. And so they've been awake much longer when they go to work. The other time when these two systems are not properly aligned is if you've ever had jet lag. You've flown to another country and you really want to be awake because you want to try those Parisian baguettes or whatever, and you can't stay awake because your body wants you to be asleep. You have takes a while for your body clock to readjust to local time. And that's an example where your body clock from your circadian rhythm is out of sync with, the inter with uh, how local time. So we're going to try and convince you that there are three pillars of health. And if anybody knows how to reach Michelle Obama, we'd really like to know. Because for children, she's promoting exercise and nutrition. And we really like to ask her to add sleep to it. Uh, as Gina mentioned before, if you try and diet and you're not getting enough sleep, it's going to be harder for you to lose weight. We want to try and convince you that you need to have enough sleep and have exercise and have nutrition to have a pr good health or work towards good health. So one of the questions I frequently get asked is, how much sleep do I really need? 
And we don't really know how long, how much sleep or what governs how long you sleep, though we know your circadian rhythms influence that, and we know how long it's been, how long you've been awake influences, but the actual length we don't know. But I did this study in which we took people who habitually slept at home anywhere between six hours and 10 hours at night. And they did that for a couple weeks before they came in. We didn't allow them to have caffeine before they came in to make sure they weren't using caffeine to stay awake. And we didn't allow them to have caffeine when they came into the lab or anything that would help them keep awake. And for the first night in the lab, we recorded their sleep while they slept at their usual time and the usual duration, whether it was six hours or eight hours or nine hours or 10 hours. And then we put them on a, on a schedule in which they got 12 hours of sleep at night, and then they were awake for four hours, and then they got a four hour nap opportunity, and then they were awake for four hours. And we did this for seven days. The first night, the, the first day that they had 20, uh, 16 hours of sleep available, the average amount of sleep was 12 and a half hours. So, including the people who said they only needed six hours of sleep, they were sleeping hours and hours more than they would at home. It took them several days to acclimate to sort of asymptote out to around eight to 10 hours, eight to nine hours in the younger, sub, in the old, younger subjects, and around seven to eight hours in the older subjects. So, what is happening is if you don't let people get out of bed, which we didn't let people do in this protocol, and they didn't know what time of day it was, this looks like a biological need where people weren't getting enough immediately and they, over, they rebound and then they come down to a level, a different level. So this would suggest that by some biological mechanism, people, younger people may need, quote, quote unquote, may need more sleep than older people, but the levels are eight, eight or more hours. So what happens if you get too little sleep? We're gonna be talking a little about health. So body systems linked to diseases such as diabetes don't work as well. There's changes in hormones that lead to obesity. Your immune function is impaired. If you're sleep restricted and you get a vaccination, your body does not mount the same response as it would as if you had gotten sufficient sleep. There's this big question about whether or not sleep is related to obesity. So if you look at the average amount of sleep per day, since 1900 to, tw well, projected to 2020, you can see that we are sleeping far fewer hours per day. And if you look at the percent of the US population that's obese, that level has gone up dramatically. And there are many people, including Dr. Redlinen, who's examining this particular relationship on many different levels. So with too little sleep, academic performance is impaired. So I gave this talk at my kid's high school, and of course I got the hand raised that said, well, if I didn't study, how much sleep do I need to get? Can I pull an all-nighter before the exam? And of course, I said, well, you should have studied before the night before the exam. And they went, okay, but I didn't. What do I do? <laughs> and I said, well, if you pull an all-nighter, you might pass the exam, but you're not going to remember it when you need it for the final because you need sleep to consolidate the memories that you made during the day. You need sleep to learn what you learn during the day for it to be transitioned into long-term memory. And so while if they pulled an all-nighter and then took the exam, they weren't gonna consolidate it and have what they need later. So, and then of course there's the kids that fall asleep in the classroom, which teachers will report. So memory and learning is harder, paying attention and completing work is harder, concentrating, problem solving, all of that is harder. We did a study in which we purposely put people on insufficient sleep to see whether people could adjust to not getting enough sleep. So they were on insufficient sleep for three weeks, and they were on the equivalent of five and a half hours of sleep versus eight hours of sleep, and each wake episode was around 30 hours long because we were looking at extended wake. And you can see in the first week, there's a little bit of worsening on this particular performance test, but by the second week, they get much worse and it continues on for three weeks. So they don't learn to live on less sleep. They stabilize at this worse level. Now what's really interesting is they seem to be fine for the first two to six hours. For this study, people actually got 10 hours in bed before we kept them awake for 30 hours. My daughter looked at this and said, um, oh, is that why some countries have siestas? Because you do fine for the first few hours if you haven't gotten enough sleep, and then you, need, you, get, you start getting tired. And this is why we also think that people say, oh, I'm doing fine on the first few, I'm on not enough sleep, because when they first wake up, even if they haven't had a cup of coffee, they do fine. It's just after they've been awake for a, first, for a few hours that they start worsening and they maintain that worst level. 
One of the big problems that we have with people in sleep is that there's a, uh, in understanding how much sleep they need, is that there's a big disconnect between how sleepy you think you are and how tired you actually work on a performance test. So here's an example from a study at UPenn where they put people on eight hours of time in bed for 14 days, six hours of time in bed, four hours in time in bed, or they had a total sleep deprivation, zero hours in time in bed for a couple days. And you can see that the people who are on eight hours time in bed, actually their performance got slightly worse over the 14 days, which suggests that eight hours time in bed is not enough because you don't get eight hours of sleep if you're in bed for eight hours. Um, six hours they got worse, four hours they got worse, and of course the level at um, the sleep deprivation they got worse. But what happened that's scary is that if you ask them how tired they think they are, it does not continue to worsen. It's as if you're idea of how tired you are depends on how tired you were the day before or a couple minutes before. Your idea of how tired you are is not a good reflection of how tired you actually are. And there are stories of people who've been treated for sleep apnea in which their sleep is disturbed, and after you start treating them, they say, oh, I didn't realize what alert felt like. They just don't remember what alert feels like. So that's a big worry. And the problem is that people decide whether or not they're safe to drive based on how sleepy they think they are not based on their reaction time on a test, which would be the equivalent of how quickly can you brake or swerve if you need to when you're driving. And once again, as I said, tried to say at the beginning, the issue is that sleep is a biological necessity. And so even if you know what you're doing, even if you know how to drive a car, if you're tired and the body says it's time for you to go to sleep, it's very hard to stay awake. And so some of the resistance we sometimes get is that people say, oh, I'm trained, or my people are trained. They know how to drive. They know how to do this skill. And training is not enough for a biological necessity. So I'm repeating myself a little, but also with too little sleep, the quality of life and your mood is impaired. People feel more sad. They tend to feel more irritable. And they tend to have, might have social problems. Not tend, not in all, but it happens. We've discussed safety several times. Uh, Chernobyl nuclear plant, all the, nu the major nuclear power plant, the two major nuclear power plant accidents in the Exxon Valdez happened at a time of day when the biological clock was promoting sleep very early in the morning. Uh, we just changed our clocks. There are more car accidents the Monday after we change our clocks in the spring where you lose an hour than in the fall when you gain an hour, and that's just an hour. So it shows you how sleep deprived most people are and how sensitive these people are for an additional hour of sleep. And there are actually more needle sticks and diagnostic errors in me medical personnel. And you would think that a medical personnel who's very highly trained really doesn't want to get a needle stick. But once again, if you're tired, there's more errors and accidents. And drowsy driving is red alert. So from the National Sleep Foundation, there are 100,000 crashes each year caused by sleepy drivers. 55% of those are caused by those younger than 25 years old. And I just said more accidents after you lose an hour than you gain an hour. And as Gina said, uh, being awake for 24 hours, here's a performance test, here's being awake for 24 hours, is the equivalent of being 0 .0, 0 0.10. And indeed, some of us are trying to get drowsy driving regulated the way drunk driving is regulated. So drowsiness is red alert. Countermeasure, these following countermeasures do not work. Um, cool air, like rolling down your window, works for around 10 minutes. The radio works for around two minutes. Exercise works as long as you're out of the car. <laughs> and if you stop for 30 minutes, have some caffeine, has 15 minute nap that gives you around an hour. Um, I had somebody tell me they put their ponytail in the moon roof so that when they fell asleep, it would jerk them awake. Okay. <laughs> so to summarize, sleep. You need it, even if you're busy and you're highly competent. It's good for you. It's free. You don't need to join a gym. You don't need special clothing. As a matter of fact, old raggedy clothing that's comfortable is the best kind. You don't need a doctor's appointment. You don't need a prescription. It has no side effects. Now, some people say, well, I feel groggy when I wake up. That's called sleep inertia, and it's actually normal, and it should go away relatively soon, even if you don't have caffeine. There's no expensive devices or equipment unless you have a medical sleep disorder. You can do it at home. For vacation, you don't have to go far away. You know, you don't have to climb in an airplane and go to, you don't have to go to Logan Airport and pass security. There's no learning involved, and it feels good. So we're hoping to convince you, try a little more of it. It'll be good for you, you'll feel better, and you'll, 
many parts of your health will improve. If, however, you are still tired after eight hours of time in bed for a couple nights, or your bed partner complains that you snore or you kick, you should go see a sleep specialist because there may be something that we can do to help you. Or if your bed partner also notices that you stopped, stopped breathing, yes. So here's the website, and um, I'm happy to turn it over to Dr. Redline now. Thank you very much for your attention, and we look forward to questions later. Well, thank you, um, Dr. Clareman, for that really lovely talk, and I think you've educated everyone here. And what I will do is I'm going to start by seeing how alert you were. I'm going to ask you a few questions that will reflect some of what Dr. Clerman said. And then we'll talk a little bit about sleep disorders. As um, was just alluded to, those are real issues that can interfere with or impede everyone's good intentions of getting that sleep they need. So let's start with a quiz. I think everyone's competitive enough that will wake them up. So think about your own sleep and really reflect on the question of whether you regularly feel unrefreshed even after wakening from a full night's sleep. And by now you know a full night's sleep if you're an adult should be between seven or eight or even more hours per night. Second question I'd like you to reflect on is do you fall asleep easily during your waking hours while at work, home, or behind the wheel? Um, now, are you or have you been told that you've allowed habitual snorer? You don't have to answer that out loud. Has your bed partner witnessed you choking, gasping, or holding your breath at night? That <coughs> sound. And do you, and you know, again, you don't have to um, share your answers, but do you suffer sometimes? or more with poor concentration, judgment, memory loss, irritability, or depression. So obviously I'm asking all these questions because these are the types of questions a clinician um, interested in sleep disorders and sleep insufficiency may consider with their patients. And now think a bit about Dr. Clerman's lecture and reflect about whether you now are convinced whether your poor sleep or those of people that you know might be influencing things like appetite, blood pressure, heart disease risk, or even longevity. And in fact, as was alluded to, in fact, sleep affects all these aspects of your health and longevity, and we'll talk very briefly about how that may happen. So we've just heard that insufficient sleep um, really has a wide range of effects on multiple organ systems in our body. And in fact, although you might function optimally between seven and nine hours of sleep, we know that people who regularly get, say, less than six hours of sleep are at more than 30 times more likely to have risks of developing diabetes, coronary artery disease, heart attacks, strokes, developing obesity, and premature mortality. Wide range of metabolic, cardiovascular, and longevity effects. So true or false, I'm putting up, insufficient sleep leads to hormonal changes that accelerate that pounce process and leads to obesity. So obviously you're here and we're here because in fact, as was alluded to by even our introductory speaker, there's excellent data now indicating that insufficient sleep does in fact impact actually how much energy we consume and burn and lead to obesity. And in fact, we know now that insufficient sleep triggers stress hormones, we've heard about cortisol, alters the release of growth hormones, also alters our secretion of insulin and glucose, which is so key to our overall health, including weight management, as well as specifically influencing the secretion or the release of hormones that regulate our appetite. So in particular, there are two hormones that have got a lot of attention. One of these is called leptin, 
And that is an appetite suppressant hormone that's released by our own fat in our body. And the other, which has the opposing effect, is something called ghrelin, which is released by our stomach and is an appetite-stimulating hormone. And data from multiple studies now indicate that as we get less sleep, and this graph is a little bit small, but this is sleep on the x-axis and we're getting less sleep here. And this is showing as we're getting less sleep, our leptin levels are getting lower. That is, we have less of that appetite suppressant levels in direct proportion to the decreased amount of sleep. And here, and this is data from the, um, a study in Wisconsin, but it's been shown in other studies, we see just the opposite for ghrelin levels. That is, as we get left sleep, ghrelin, the appetite-stimulating hormone, goes up. And this data was on over 1,000 people studied in Madison, Wisconsin. Not only do these appetite hormones change as we get less sleep in a way to make us um, you know, um, in a way that one would anticipate would increase our appetite. But in fact, if we experimentally sleep deprive you and bring you into a laboratory and only let you get four or five hours of sleep, the next morning if we present you with a buffet of foods, including healthy eggs and um, vegetables and fruits, and then also a buffet that consists of potatoes and um, uh, Fritos and cheese doodles. What do you think you're going to crave the next morning? Well, scientifically, it's been shown that after an experimental night of sleep deprivation, people crave that junk food almost inexplicably. And in fact, now we know from very exciting data where the brain is imaged with functional magnetic resonance imaging and other tests that, in fact, not only do hormone levels change in response to acute and chronic sleep deprivation, but our brain's reward centers that are triggered by the sight and smell of food also changes after a night of sleep deprivation. And this is actually shown in this particular slide, which was, a uh, which was a study by Dr. Kilgore in Boston and colleagues, who looked in particular at these functional magnetic resonant imaging studies and show that as people got more and more sleepy, that certain areas of their brain, in particular in the prefrontal cortex, lit up. And these are areas in the brain that usually inhibit us from doing things that we shouldn't be doing, like overeating. So a direct relationship of sleep deprivation as well as sleepiness with interfering with very specific and multiple areas of the brain that control rewards, hedonistic responses, and inhibi inhibition. So um, that may be, again, a very important mechanism that we have trouble um, when we're stressed, we might not sleep, and then we have trouble inhibiting our appetite. Um, now, in addition, um, so why don't we get sleep? So as alluded to, most of us don't get sleep because of various behavioral lifestyles, occupational life demands. We are in a 24-hour day society. The lights are on, the phone's ringing, the computers are on. Um, and so there's clearly those behavioral lifestyle and real work issues. Many of us also have gotten to bad habits. We have what's called poor sleep hygiene. That is, we don't really respect that one time in every 24-hour cycle that we're supposed to wind down and get to bed at the same time and wake up at the same time and avoid caffeine and alcohol and things that can disrupt our sleep. And then some of us, actually a good number of us, have sleep disorders, real medical conditions that can be treated. And now I'm going to talk about some of those. So amongst the most common disorders is snoring, which is a mild form of actually a very common and serious condition known as sleep apnea, which affects almost 18 million Americans. There's also insomnia, which chronically may affect about 15% of the population, although about half of us have experienced transient insomnia at some time. Restless leg syndrome, which I'll define soon, may affect 2 to 15% of people. 
We heard a little bit about some circadian rhythm disorders that may occur when we travel, like with jet lag, but also there are disorders that occur really across the lifespan that we'll talk about, as well as disorders precipitated by shift work. And finally, but very significantly, there is a relatively rare but very serious disorder called narcolepsy. So what is snoring? Snoring, as you'll see in the next slide, people often giggle about, and although some people think culturally it may be sort of robust breathing at night, but in fact what snoring is is representing a a partial collapse of really the tissues in the airway. And this is really looking into the throat with the uvula dangling there and the tonsils on either side. And what happens with snoring is that as we go to sleep, the neuromuscular input that holds those, that into the muscles that holds our throat open really goes down. And those tissues start to vibrate. And that vibration causes a snore. And that snoring actually may then progress to a total collapse, causing an apnea, which means no breathing. And so snoring is a sign of sleep apnea, but by itself, snoring can cause excessive vibrations, disturb your sleep, and even may predispose to stroke by actually traumatizing the arteries that supply the brain. So as I said, snoring is often giggled about. Um, we know that one of the risk factors for snoring are things that will reduce the tone of our muscles, and that includes drinking alcohol before bedtime, too much booze, I snooze. And we also that know snoring is more common in men than women. And some people, I am man, hear me snore, are proud of their snoring. It's nothing to be ashamed of, but it may be a sign of a serious condition called sleep apnea. So what is sleep apnea? So sleep apnea means, as I said, no breath. And what happens with sleep apnea is the person has repetitive episodes where their throat closes. And this is a lateral diet cartoon of someone breathing at night. This is their tongue muscle right there. This is their soft palate. This is tonsils. And you could see that normally breathing in blue, the air should go right through your nose down into your lungs. And when you have apnea, all these tissues come together, collapse, and obstruct your breathing. And that causes a major stress on your system. Your oxygen levels go down, your brain wakes up, your catecholamines or adrenaline is released, and your blood pressure may go to levels of 220 or more. So it can be a very big stimulus. And it's a very common condition. As I said, it can affect as many as about 18 million people in this country. It's, um, and also, um, it can cause many different other health effects that I'll talk about in a minute. So when we diagnose sleep apnea, we usually measure your breathing at night. And what we like to see, and here is a five minute picture from a limited sleep study measuring airflow, um, chest wall effort, um, uh, um, your, your belly um, breathing at night, your, 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 um, and this is, these all, and your oxygen levels, but this is 100% um, oxygen, what we call saturation. And this is really normal breathing. And what you could see is that breathing is going up and down in a very regular fashion, and in fact, oxygen levels stay constant. In contrast, People whose throat muscles start collapsing don't have that nice regular breathing, but have these periods that could last a minute or more where essentially there is no breathing going on. And in fact, at the end of the breathing, there is evidence of oxygen levels falling. And in fact, this is a five minute page, and you can see you don't have to be a sleep specialist to know that something not very right is going on. Because this here, if you focus, is airflow, and you could see period after, you know, really every 60 seconds, there's really a period of almost 40 to 45 seconds where there's no breathing, and you see this roller coaster. That's your oxygen levels being recorded going down and up and down and up, causing, and this can happen hundreds and hundreds of times over the night. So what are the symptoms of sleep apnea? Snoring we talked about. Also, those pauses or those collapse might cause a snorting or gasping sound as you resuscitate yourself and you finally open that throat up to breathe again after a pause. 
with those resuscitative breaths, you, your brain may wake up. You may or may not be aware, though, that your brain is waking up, but you're not getting into good, deep sleep. And then in the morning, you don't feel ready to go. And during the day, you may be one of those people falling asleep behind the wheels or just not attending or being, or being alert. Also, due to not getting enough oxygen at night and breathing through your mouth, you may have morning headaches as well as a dry mouth. Now, who gets sleep apnea? Well, the typical cartoon is the fat boy from, jo from um, the Pickwickian papers, you know, would be a middle-aged man with what we call central obesity, that is, a big waist as well as a wide neck. In Australia, they screen for obesity by asking you your collar size. Men with collar sizes of greater than 17 are at increased risk for sleep apnea. Women with collar sizes of greater than 16. Um, but other risk factors are family history. If you have a relative with sleep apnea, you're at increased risk. People with a small or recessed jaw, and as you get older, you also are at increased risk. However, let me also emphasize that that's the caricature. Women get sleep apnea as, much as, me, um, as well as men, and thin people as well as overweight people. In fact, one in five people in the U.S. have at least mild sleep apnea, and moderate to severe sleep apnea occurs about 1 in 15 U.S. people. And the majority of people, 70 to 85 percent, don't know they have sleep apnea. Now, the reason we get worked up about this is that these stresses, these almost a stress test your body undergoes every night when it's not getting enough oxygen and your airway is collapsing, causes a range of behavioral, cognitive, functional impairments, increases your risk of accidents, predisposes to diabetes, increases blood pressure not only at night, but that lasts during the daytime, and also is associated with increased mortality. Now, there's also, we know that um, sleep apnea is associated with cardiovascular disease, and we know that atherosclerosis, where you have extra fat being lined in the arteries of the body, is mediated by various inflammatory proteins in the, in the system. And in fact, in sleep apnea, you get an excess release of all the same inflammatory proteins that have been associated with cardiovascular disease. Now, this is a study that was done in Spain that's very important for a couple of reasons. One is that if um, about 1,000 individuals, adults in Spain, were followed for about 10 years, and on the y-axis here, they looked at the rate by which people developed heart disease or even fatal heart disease down here. And most of the group had a fairly low incidence of heart disease, and in this light blue collar, those were people without any sleep apnea. However, what you could see is those people with severe sleep apnea in red had about a threefold higher rate of developing heart disease, fatal or otherwise, than those who didn't have sleep apnea. And what was very, very important is really looking at really the dotted line down here. And those were people with severe sleep apnea that were treated for their sleep apnea. And you could see that their rates of heart disease were almost as low as those controls or those without sleep apnea, suggesting that not only sleep apnea predisposes to heart disease, but effective treatment for sleep apnea may actually reduce your risk to almost that of someone who never had the condition to begin with. This also is a very interesting um, piece of research from the Mayo Clinic that looked at the time people die. Um, and they used a large database from um, um, Wisconsin. And here, this is in white, is actually the pre really the um, individual's prevalence of dying um, who have sleep apnea. And in fact, in blue are the people without sleep apnea. And this is the overall likelihood of dying at different points of the day. And you could see that people with sleep apnea are more likely to die at night, giving sort of, sort of you know, empirical types of support that the nighttime could even be a dangerous time for people with sleep apnea. So now let's move to the, really the second most common disorder that many of you could relate to, and that's insomnia. That, as at some point in time, may affect 50 to 33% of the adult population occasionally, and is a chronic condition, meaning lasting for months at a time in 10 to 15% of people. 
It could be precipitated by response to an acute life event, but then in response to maladaptive responses to that stress, it could become chronic. Now, what is insomnia? We define insomnia by a complaint of inadequate or poor sleep with problems getting to sleep, frequent awakenings, waking too early in the morning, not feeling refreshed when we wake up, and, um, and then having daytime sequelae, not doing well because of that sleep-related problem. And it tends to occur when people who have high levels of arousability, often with anxiety, and, some, and also may be a precursor to developing depression. So again, insomnia, although it's annoying, and, but it, it goes beyond that. It can cause irritability, problems with concentration, and people with depression who also have insomnia at our increased risk for developing recurrent relapses of depression compared to people who don't have insomnia, focusing on the need that sleep is important for also for mental health. But not only mental health, but patients with insomnia have increased rates of heart attacks, recurrent heart attacks even after their first one, as well as diabetes. So again, and that is because of some of the things we talked about with sleep deprivation, that inadequate sleep causes dysregulation of glucose, insulin, inflammatory um, proteins, and so forth. Now let me just briefly talk about restless leg syndrome because for those people who have this, this is a very disabling condition. It's really, um, it's, a sim it, it, it's, a, it, it's a sensor, a neurosensory problem where people feel unpleasant, tingling, creepy feelings and nervousness in their legs. They describe it as though worms are crawling under their legs, though it could infect the arms too. It, can, it, has, it has a genetic component and may run in families and um, can also be associated with other medical conditions. It's often underdiagnosed and increases with age. However, it can occur in children and be misdiagnosed as growing pains. It's especially common in women and actually may manifest in pregnancy because iron deficiency may also trigger it. Um, it also goes up as we get older. And as I said, it, it can actually sometimes be um, partially treated with iron um, supplements. And again, just like the other sleep disorders, this disorder has a wide range of health effects, fatigue, but also what happens is patients with restless legs often have leg jerks at night, and that wakes them up from sleep. And in fact, those arousals they experience with the leg jerks stimulate their blood pressure and heart rate to go up, and such individuals are also at increased risk for cardiovascular disease, peripheral vascular disease, and cardiac arrhythmias. Um, we talked, um, we mentioned briefly circadian um, rhythm disorders, and again, just to emphasize that we talked, heard a little bit about shift work and jet lab, where your biological clock and the world are not aligned. I like to just, because of time's sake, just to say that circadian problems not only can cause the sleepiness and memory and work-related impairments, but, patient, but now shift work is now known to be a carcinogen. Patients who work shifts are at increased risk for cancer as well as diabetes. Narcolepsy, just in brief, is, is that condition really where have people have irresistible sleepiness and that's really a problem with control of a sleep-wake system and there are real medications and, and genetic reasons um, that can be treated and genetic underlying reasons. So let me just conclude as I gave you a very brief overview of the most common sleep disorders, try to link them to health conditions that are important from a public health perspective. But let me reiterate what Dr. Clerman said as well, is that sleep is a basic biological need. It's essential for our health, performance, safety, quality of life, but also hormonal ba balance and physiologic function of our nervous cardiovascular systems and metabolism. Sleep disorders, as I have said are very common, often underrecognized and untreated, but effective treatment can improve daily functioning and prevent the development or the severity of chronic health conditions. Thank you.
So uh, while they're getting the, there we go, <clears throat> getting my talk up, uh, you've heard a lot about sleep disorders and sleep uh, this evening, and so the burning question in all your minds probably is, do I have a sleep disorder? So that's what we'll try to cover right now. So moving right along, maybe. Oh, I guess you would do it this way. Okay, so how do how you determine whether you have a sleep problem? One of the best ways I think that you can go about it is to learn this little acronym called BEARS. And BEARS means, uh, stands for five little things here. First is B stands for bedtime problems. So do you have a problem falling asleep at bedtime? Pretty simple. Uh, to determine if you can't fall asleep readily in you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes, perhaps you actually have a problem with that. The second thing, E, is excessive sleepiness. So are you having problems staying awake during the daytime? Are you falling asleep driving? Are you falling asleep in this lecture hall? Well, maybe not. That's not a problem, but uh, you might have a problem if you're falling asleep while you're driving your car. Are you waking up frequently at night? Most people don't readily wake up you know, two, four, five, six times per night. If you're doing that, perhaps you have a sleep problem. And what about the regularity and duration of your sleep? Do you have consistent bedtimes and wake-up times, or are you going to sleep at all different times during the day and night? And do you actually sleep for seven and a half to eight hours per night, or do you only get five hours of sleep, or four hours of sleep, or six hours of sleep? And finally, do you snore loudly? We've heard a lot about how snoring is not necessarily something that's kind of good or funny, but it actually can be a serious health problem. <clears throat> so one, one thing you can do is to, fi to find out whether in fact you are sleepy is to uh, grade yourself with this instrument called the F4 sleepiness scale. So basically it asks whether what your chance of dozing or sleeping is in 12 situations, which are shown right here. And you give yourself a score. Zero stands for not <coughs> going to fall asleep in that situation. And three says that you have a high chance of dozing or falling asleep. And so then you just add them up. The top score is 24. You don't want a 24 um, because that would mean you're really sleepy. And, it's, and most of the data show that, however, that if you are greater than or equal to 10, it suggests that actually you are excessively sleepy. So you can go and take the little test yourself and figure out whether, in fact, you might be sleepy. The other thing you can do is to do a sleep diary. And you can get these sleep diaries off the internet. There's plenty of them around. You just type in sleep diary in Google or Bing or whatever search engine you're using, and you just keep track of your sleep. And you can see you'll be able to see some of them actually are graphic so that you can actually see little plots and you see if you actually have a regular bedtime and a regular wake up time and whether you're waking up a lot during the middle of the night. And if you're not having a regular wake up time, you're waking up a lot during the middle of the night or <clears throat> you're, it looks like you're not sleeping enough, you're sleeping only four or five hours, perhaps you have a sleep disorder. So the other types of things that you can ask yourself with respect to screening yourself is, am I getting enough sleep? So do you sleep more on your days off than you do on your work days? I mean, if you're sleeping 10 or 11 hours on Saturday and Sunday, perhaps you're not getting enough sleep on your work days. So how much sleep do you need? Uh, Beth talked a little bit about that. I suggest you go to, to determine that, take a little vacation test. So you go on vacation, you go down to the lake or up into the mountains, don't take any alarm clocks, so you just go to sleep when you're tired one night and you wake up when you're no longer tired. And you do this for about five days and at the end of that time, take a look and see how much you slept during that period of time. And that's probably the amount of sleep you need physiologically because everybody's a little bit different. You may only require over here might only require seven and a half hours. The person over there might need nine hours. So you need to figure out what your need for sleep is. And you can do that by just giving yourself enough opportunity to sleep so that you're not tired when you wake up in the morning. And the next thing you ought to do, obviously, we've alluded to this, is do you snore? 
So it, snoring is an interesting little phenomenon because if you sleep by yourself, you usually don't know whether or not you snore. And so first of all, obviously, if you do have a bed partner or your friend or perhaps even your dog and your cat, you might ask them whether or not you snore. Hopefully, they're honest with you. Um, no witnesses? Well, we have technology now. You can actually take a tape or a digital recorder and figure out whether or not you snore. And unfortunately, it's gone dim because I actually got a little technology on my laptop here. Well, well we can bear with it a little bit. I have a little device on here that actually dims the light on the laptop when it gets to a certain time, like sunset. We can go into why. <laughs> that is, in a minute. <clears throat> You laugh, but actually it, there's a reason for this. So if you figure out that you have a sleep problem, what are some tips that you can do to perhaps treat yourself and not bother to go to see your doctor about this sort of thing because it costs money, it takes time, you don't want to have any of those sleep tests done, right? So first of all, you should avoid caffeine, alcohol, nicotine, and other chemicals that interfere with sleep. Why? For example, caffeine and nicotine are stimulants. If you have a cup of coffee, it seems intuitive, right? If you have a cup of coffee right before you go to sleep, chances are you're not going to go to sleep too quickly. In addition, alcohol, everybody thinks of alcohol good, nightcap. Well, al actually, alcohol may facilitate sleep initially, so it does make you sleepy um, initially, but it is sleep disruptive, so you wake up after two or three hours and you're not able to go back to sleep. So you should turn your bedroom into a sleep-inducing environment. So it should be nice, quiet, and dark. If you're in a noisy environment, for example, you're living next to a train station or something like that, you might consider earplugs or white noise generators. You should keep your room temperature about 60 to 76 degrees. Uh, you should establish a soothing pre-sleep routine. If you're having problems, you may take a warm bath. It actually is soothing. You kind of relax a little bit. You shouldn't engage in stressful activities. You know, I wouldn't you know, engage in a political discussion with a person of the opposite political party, for example, right before you go to sleep. Um, you should go to sleep really when you're tired. So a lot of times people say, gee, it's 10 o'clock, I ought to be going to sleep. And they just say, that's bedtime. Well, it doesn't make actually sense to go to sleep unless you feel tired and sleepy, because all you'll do is lay in bed and make yourself anxious because you're not falling asleep, which then, in turn, gets you in the habit of saying that, hey, I'm getting into bed, I'm not going to get to sleep, and, it's, and I won't get to sleep. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. OK, so you don't want to have a, a, a clock in your room, at least not one that you can see easily, because <clears throat> then, you'll, then if you're having problems sleeping, you'll be clock watching, and that'll be frustrating. So you should remove your clock and other digital devices. So that, that brings us to the point about why the, my laptop went dim here. It turns out that many digital devices, such as your cell phones or this, uh, I saw an iPad, they, they were taking pictures of us earlier. They actually have bright light and blue light, and that changes your circadian clock and can make it harder for you to go to sleep and be sleep disruptive. So this little thing that I have on my laptop is supposed to take out that some of that light and <coughs> have less of an impact on my circadian rhythm when I'm trying to work at night, which I shouldn't be doing anyway, <laughs> but I do. Anyway, so <clears throat> you should keep your internal clock set with a consistent schedule, meaning that you want to pretty much go to bed at a regular time when you're sleepy and wake up at a regular time. And you should try to keep the same routine on weekdays and weekends. I know you're going to say, oh, I, I can't do that type of thing. I need to get my sleep because I need to make up for it on weekends because I didn't get enough on weekdays. But the solution for that is get enough sleep on weekdays. Um, you shouldn't nap, or at least nap, you should nap early, but basically you shouldn't nap at all. Because if you take a nap during the afternoon, it's just going to impact your sleep in the, afternoon, in, the, in the evening. It'll make it harder for you to go to sleep. And then, obviously, big meals close to bedtime disturb sleep. And in addition, they tend to cause heartburn, which also will be sleep disruptive. Um, so light to your advantage. So morning light improves mood and synchronizes your clock. As I said, some e-readers at bedtime may disrupt your sleep cycle. So you want to stay away from those. Um, obviously, if you have a lot to drink at night, 
That means you go to the bathroom a lot at night. And that is sleep disruptive. Exercise. I like to tell my patients to go exercise. And it's good for your health. It's, you know, it's good for your heart. It's good for your lungs. It's just good. But exercising close to bedtime may make it difficult for you to fall asleep. So go to the gym a little earlier in the day. And you need to follow through. So if you follow these tips and your sleep is still not better, you probably ought to go see your doctor. So when you go to the see your doctor, what is your doctor, what should your doctor ask you? And we're gonna play a little video here and see what the doctor should ask you. Ideally, questions about sleep would be included in every routine health evaluation. Four simple questions could lead to uncovering all the different sleep disorders. These include asking whether or not you got restful, restorative sleep, whether or not you snored or stopped breathing during the night, if you had a lot of movements during sleep, or if you were excessively sleepy during the daytime. Unfortunately, what we're finding is that those things aren't asked. Multiple surveys have shown that primary care physicians tend not to ask about that. So it's even more important for the person to make sure that they talk to their doctor about sleep, make them aware of what their sleep is like anytime they have a routine examination. So when you go to see your doctor and you say, hey, I have a problem with my sleep, you want to make sure your doctor asks you those questions. In addition, so the doctor says that, hey, you go, need to go see a sleep specialist and get a sleep evaluation. So what does that consist of? Well, as soon as we get this up here. If you decide that you have a sleep problem, you should go and see a sleep specialist. That evaluation starts with an interview. The person takes your history, goes in through the entire routine of your day, what you do during the day, how you prepare for sleep, what your sleep is like, and what's the impact on that on your daily functioning. Typically, it's by questions. You also can fill out questionnaires that help the doctor understand this routine. They'll do a brief examination to look for things that might suggest the presence of a sleep disorder. Typically, at the end of that initial evaluation, the sleep physician will have a pretty good idea of what the most likely problem is. Depending upon what it is, they may ask you to have a sleep study. A sleep study is a procedure in which you come into the laboratory or sometimes in the home. You have a device attached that records your sleep. These usually are a series of rather painless electrodes that are placed on the scalp or other parts of the body to record things such as brainwave activity, heart rate, breathing, oxygen levels, so the doctor can get a very good idea of exactly what's happening during sleep. With this, they can identify the specific sleep disorder and the severity of it, because severity is important in helping determine what kind of treatment you're going to get. After you've had your sleep study, you'll get back together with the doctor and go over the results. Part of that process is explaining exactly what the disorder is, how you got there, and then what are the things you can do about it. And together with your physician, the two of you will decide what's the best and most appropriate treatment to take care of your particular sleep disorder. Okay, so you went to see the doctor and you got a sleep uh, study of some sort, maybe. So we're going to talk a little bit about some of the sleep disorders that uh, Susan mentioned. Uh, first of all is obstructive sleep apnea. So to get a diagnosis of obstructive sleep apnea, you actually need some sort of sleep study. It can be done in the laboratory or in the home, but you need to have some verification that you're actually stopping breathing and how many times you're doing it and how severe it is. And so it basically, a sleep study confirms the diagnosis, tells you how severe, tells me or your physician how severe it is, provides us therapeutic information. For example, some people with sleep apnea only have it when they sleep on their back, for example. And Sometimes we actually test the treatment modalities. We're going to talk a little bit about positive airway pressure. And so you actually can change the pressures during the sleep study to figure out how much positive airway pressure is needed. So how do we treat sleep apnea? Basically, there are, there are several different types of treatment. The most common is what we call CPAP, or continuous positive airway pressure. Essentially, in sleep apnea, the airway collapses. CPAP basically pressurizes the airway so it keeps it open. It's like you have a balloon that's blown up and you kind of try and collapse it by pressing on it. Well, CPAP prevents you from collapsing the balloon. It requires some sort of titration because everybody 
who has sleep apnea requires a slightly different pressure to keep the airway open. And then, but if you wear a CPAP device, which is shown here, this is a mask you wear over your face or your nose, it works. The basic problem with CPAP, however, is only about two out of every three people actually will wear the device on a long-term basis for a variety of reasons. The second most popular treatment is what we call an oral appliance. You see pictures of these here. They're basically dental devices. They look kind of like the mouthpieces that uh, ball players and athletes wear you know, when they're playing games to protect their teeth. They need to be fitted by a dentist, and they work by pulling the lower jaw forward. And by pulling the lower jaw forward, you pull the tongue forward, which is one of the big obstructions in people with sleep apnea. And finally, the, the other thing that sometimes people do is some sort of surgical procedure. And you saw this graph before Dr. Redline showed it and showed the tonsils here, this thing called the uvula and the tongue. And so these are the, pure, the parts of the body or parts of the airway that collapse and obstruct the airway and sleep apnea. So surgery tries to address this by making the airway bigger, by eliminating some of these structures or reducing their size so that the airway tends to collapse less. So we're gonna actually skip the shack video because for time and talk a little bit more about restless legs. Um, so the diagnosis of restless legs does not require a sleep study. So if somebody says you need a sleep study to diagnose restless legs, they are wrong. It basically is a clinical diagnosis based on five criteria. First is the patient has a desire to move their limbs, often associated with tingling or discomfort. People describe this various ways. The, one person told me it was like having an internal itch. They just had, and because of this, they have to move their legs because it, it makes the symptoms better. So the symptoms are partially or temporarily relieved by activity. They're worse or present only during rest. So one of the a lot of patients tell me that they have to do something about their restless legs because like they can't take an airplane trip. I just got off an airplane five and a half hours flying in from San Francisco yesterday, so I'm jet lagged. That's why I'm not making a lot of sense up here this, this <laughs> evening. But I can tell you if I had restless legs, it would have been sheer agony because you know the pilot, they love to put that seatbelt sign on because, they don't, because there's always turbulence. But that's the worst thing for a person with restless legs because they can't, they can't get about get out into the aisle and walk around, which is the only thing that will make their symptoms better. And then the other thing about restless legs, there's nighttime worsening of the symptoms. And obviously it can't be explained by other things. There are some other diseases around that kind of mimic restless legs, but an astute clinician can, make the, can differentiate between them and determine whether you have restless legs or not. So how do you treat restless legs? Well, <clears throat> not everybody requires treatment. So I have patients that tell me they have restless legs, but they only have it once a month, and not too badly at that. So those people, I actually tell them not to get treated, or I encourage them not to be treated, because the treatment involves medications, usually, and the medications have side effects, and so sometimes you, the treatment's worse than the disease. So you don't want to make a person worse in an attempt to make them better. Um, now, it turns out that we know now, a lot of evidence shows that restless, in some patients, restless legs is caused by iron deficiency. So anybody who gets the diagnosis of restless legs should have their iron checked. So because if they're low, you can actually take care of the problem by just taking supplemental iron. Now, as for medications, there's several, several different classes. I'm not gonna go into, the, go into this, but in restless legs, there's individual dosing. You just can't get one dose, for example because you have to kind of fiddle with the medications, titrate it up according to a person's symptoms. And it also changes throughout the course of the disease. So, and then many patients require more than one drug. So a person with restless legs, if you actually have it fairly bad, you probably do need to see a sleep specialist because this takes a little bit of knowledge and skill to get your medications right. What about insomnia? Well, as you heard, insomnia is the inability to initiate sleep, stay asleep, have early morning awakenings, and this is actual or perceived. There actually is a subcategory of insomnia where actually, if you take the patient 
and you do a sleep test on them, there's nothing wrong with their sleep. They sleep just fine. But if you ask them how well they slept, they said, I slept horribly. So that person is what we call having sleep state misperception or paradoxical insomnia. And yes, you say, well, they're sleeping fine. So the objective evidence is that they sleep fine, but the subjective evidence of how they feel is they're not sleeping fine, but they still are classed as having insomnia. It, again, is a clinical diagnosis. We don't get sleep studies on people with insomnia unless we've been treating them for a while and they don't respond to therapy, in which case we say, well, maybe there is something that could be causing them to have a problem. Let's take a look. There are generally two categories of insomnia. One is primary insomnia, which means that you have a sleep problem, you have insomnia, there's no obvious cause for why you have insomnia. And then there is comorbid or secondary insomnia in which the insomnia appears to be caused by another medical condition. For example, if you have chronic pain for one reason or the other, you frequently have problems with your sleep and you have what we call comorbid or secondary insomnia. So how do you treat insomnia? Basically, there are two approaches. One is there's a lot of sleeping medications out there. You can go to the drugstore, and you can go down the aisle, and you'll see a lot of things that are marketed to treat your insomnia. Um, or you can go see your physician, and he may give you a hypnotic, a sleeping medication, to, to try and treat your problem sleeping. And then there's what we call cognitive behavioral therapy, which is a non-pharmacologic approach to treating your insomnia. It's basically using strategies that are useful in promoting sleep and also trying to figure out what psychologically or cognitively is your beliefs that may be impairing your ability to go to sleep. And these can be directed by a therapist, either in a group or individually, or believe it or not, there are internet programs which you can go to and for a small little fee, you can actually use the internet to have cognitive behavioral therapy. So, it turns out that there have been a number of studies done comparing whether medications are better or CBT or cognitive behavioral therapy is better. And this is the only data slide that I'm going to show you in, in my presentation. And this is a study done way back in 1999 where they took patients with chronic insomnia and they randomized them to cognitive behavioral therapy, a sleeping medication, both, both therapies, or nothing at all. And this shows you their insomnia score, basically, over the course of two years. This is before treatment, immediately after having treatment, and then in follow-up. And what you see here, this, is, this line here is the people who got placebo. This here is the people who got, um, I believe, the drugs. This is the combined therapy, and this is cognitive behavioral therapy. The important point is the people who got cognitive behavioral therapy had the best response to therapy, and they also had the most sustained response to therapy. So even though getting medications and also combined worked, the response was not as well sustained as having cognitive behavioral therapy, which is why most sleep specialists will, if you have chronic insomnia, will try to treat you without medications initially. So that's all I have to say. And I think we're going to answer questions now. I would like to emphasize that we have a website at Harvard here which, in which some of those videos and also the video that didn't show of Shaquille O'Neal being evaluated for sleep apnea are, believe me, yes, he has it, and uh, big neck, you know. And um, so we have a lot, of, a lot of the things that we've said are on this website. You're welcome to go to understandingsleep.org and peruse it at your leisure. Thank you. Those are all yours. So, hi. Uh, thank you for staying and those who have to leave. I hope you get home safely, especially if you're driving. And uh, we will now answer some questions. Thank you all for so many questions, and unfortunately, we can't answer all of them, so we got to pick and choose. So, the first question I'm going to answer is, will drinking Red Bull or other energy drinks improve your performance despite sleep deprivation? And the answer is yes. Actually, caffeine in the form of coffee or tea is the most widely traded commodity in the world. But hopefully we've convinced you that the purpose of sleep is not just to make you perform better. And so while Red Bull might help you perform better, it won't help with the other healthy things that are required for extra 
that you get with extra sleep. The next question I wanted to answer was, how long does it take to re-engineer your body to a normal circadian rhythm when it's become irregular? And that's actually a very complicated problem because it's a question about light timing in the morning will shift your clock in one direction, light timing in the afternoon will switch it in another. So it depends on which direction you've shifted, how has it gone? So it's a little bit complicated. I'd be happy to talk about that later. How do I shut off my internal 4.30 a.m. clock? So uh, I'm guessing this is by a woman going through menopause or slightly after menopause. And this is an excellent question. It's well known that women going through menopause and uh, have early morning awakening. And there are many there are studies going on trying to address that. How do you turn it off? Well, when you wake up at 4.30 in the morning, you don't look at your walk clock, as Dr. Kwan said. You don't turn on a light to read, and you uh, don't get out of bed, and you try and stay awake in the dark and not get up. And when that happens to me, I try and stay in bed till around 6 o'clock which of course means I've looked at the clock. But the main thing is don't look at, don't worry about it, and hopefully you'll go back to sleep. The issue is also whether or not something's waking up at 4.30. Is it your kid or a garbage can or something else that's happening? Blackout shades are really nice. Is it true that you can optimally time a nap during natural cyclical patterns? I don't know how to do that. Um, I think naps are occasionally good, but if you're really doing naps, you're probably not getting enough sleep at night. And that reminds me, actually, Dr. Kwan, I want you to slightly change it. One of your um, issues was, are you getting enough sleep? And he talked mostly about if it takes you a long time to go to sleep. If you fall asleep the minute your head hits the pillow, that's a good sign you're not getting enough sleep. My father used to joke that he could fall asleep before the flight attendants did the little safety announcement. That means you're really too tired. So. Um, are these the ones that uh, Dr. Redline? So um, does sleep deprivation affect our neurological health? Yes. Um, so um, I wish I had spent a little more time in that. So um, in fact, it does. Um, and we talked about how sleep deprivation may affect how our brain responds to cues in the environment, like you know, um, sort of high caloric food and not. But in fact, over the long term, there are um, there is evidence that sleep disorders may predispose to certain neuro neurologic diseases, including developing cognitive impairment and even dementia over time. One of some of the best evidence is actually studies of, um, it was a cohort that actually our group has been involved in studying from around the country of older women. And in that particular study, we show that women, and there were women about age 85 or 82 when we studied them, and over five years, those who had sleep apnea actually were at about a two-fold increased risk of developing dementia five years later. And we attributed that to low levels of oxygen that were impacting their brain function and accelerating their likelihood of dementia. But we do know that, um, and I think there was a qu another question, that sleep deprivation, um, as well as other sleep disorders may influence a number of other neurologic um, problems as well. And one of the others is sleep deprivation, for example, may precipitate or exacerbate a seizure disorder. So there's a number of different neurologic um, sort of connections between lack of sleep and lack of, lack of oxygen and brain function. Great. What about sleep talking and sleepwalking? Yeah. So sleep talking and sleep walking are generally thought to be disorders of arousal. They actually tend to occur in really deep sleep. They're very common, as many of you know, um, during early childhood. And they're thought in some ways to be normal variants that most people go, that people who have, have these abnormal sort of, what we what also call parasomnias, abnormal behaviors in deep sleep. They, they clearly don't wake up. They are sort of um, having abnormal behaviors in those deepest stages of sleep, that usually tends to get better as um, one gets older. It can actually get worse, though, when you're sleep deprived. So if you have a child and knows someone with this problem, one thing to try to do is to try to sort of make sure that the child or you or, or whoever you know isn't chronically sleep deprived. Thank you. Is it possible to oversleep, sleep too much so that you're st and still be tired? Sleep so much that you are still tired. Is it possible to oversleep? Okay, so Dr. Clerman and I might disagree a little <laughs> bit on this question, but in, but sh we both agree that the optimal amount of sleep that people need is still up for debate. And what we do know is in adults, 
And on average, um, when we relate to what people report they get from a sleep perspective and their overall health profile, the over, you know, the people who get seven to eight hours of sleep a night by self-report, which is a little different than when you measure it in the laboratory the way Dr. Clerman talked about, they seem to have the best health profile. And then as I mentioned, getting less than six or five hours of sleep seems to be associated with accelerated rates of heart disease and diabetes and death. But what I didn't say was that actually those people getting nine or more hours or reporting nine or more hours of sleep all chronically also seem to be at increased risk. So I think there is an active area of research that perhaps there, there may be a phenomenon where chronically too much sleep may, may in fact have some negative consequences, maybe related to less physical conditioning, more sedentary behavior, or um, even some misalignment of your, you know, of, of your activity. But that's really a very controversial and a really difficult question that it's an area of great interest to us from a research perspective. You're right, we disagree slightly. <laughs> <laughs> so our con from my perspective, the concern is the people that are sleeping nine or 10 hours. You alluded to it slightly, is whether they're actually in bed that long as opposed to actually getting the nine or 10 hours. If you're sick, you sleep more. If you have bad sleep apnea, you might have to stay in bed for more hours in order to feel rested. And so my concern is that if you're sleeping, if you're in bed that much more, are you really sleeping that much more? Or is it that the people who are reporting more hours of sleep have something, some adverse health, some health problem that is, inf that is ending up that they're sleeping more? From the study that I showed before where we gave people hours, 16 hours of sleep opportunity, they sp at the end of the study, they were spending eight hours awake in bed. Believe me, they would have been happy to fall asleep again because they weren't allowed out of bed and they weren't allowed to do anything. Um, except lie in bed. And there's no evidence that somebody can sleep when they're no longer tired. So Dr. Redline and I agree that more work needs to be done on this. How's that? Um, studies are showing that there may be risks associated with Ambien and other sleep medications. What do you think, Dr. Kwan or Dr. Redline? Well, um, first of all, those studies uh, are done. There's, there are several large population studies in which they purport to show that Ambien is associated with increased risk of various things, including death. Um, the problem here is that they're not controlled studies, and they're, they're done in large populations. They show an association, and, but, and they try to, what we do in statistics is try to control for all the things that would, might explain the effect, but it's impossible basically to control for all of these things. Now certainly, uh, if a person takes Ambien, it may be a marker that they have some other illness. Um, I think basically the medication, you know, they, it does have some side effects and people should be aware of them when they take the drug and their doctor should tell them. But you know, I think it's a relatively safe medication otherwise for, for, sleep, for sleeping problems if used properly. And I think it's too premature to say that it actually should be banned or because it causes uh, premature death. Thank you. You have your question cards. Oh, I have all these question cards. <laughs> Those are just yours. <laughs> did, how did you find? Because I have Dr. Redlines in mine. Oh, okay. Well, one of them was about sleepwalking. I think that was uh, taken care of. Uh, there's a question here about uh, how does having a spouse who snore affects a partner's sleep? It's not good for the spouse's sleep. <laughs> we, actually, we actually have studied that and have did a study in which we looked at the impact of snoring on spouse's sleep, and several other people have done this as well. And generally speaking, the, the person who, um, doesn't, who is the spouse of the snorer actually has, a, in, has an impact on the adversely Im impacting their sleep. Dr. Kwan, I think you, you or one of your colleagues termed it the spousal arousal syndrome. <laughs> that wasn't me. I wish I was, could have been uh, so original. Um, we talked to Susan and Dr. Redline talked about sleep talking, so I'll, we'll dismiss that one. Um, explain something about sleep disorders with heart disease. I think that was explained. That should have been your question, actually. But uh, <clears throat> I think that Dr. Redline showed, showed a lot of data up there that indicates that there is an association between uh, various sleep disorders and heart disease. In fact, uh, some of the studies that actually both of us did 
demonstrated, for example, that obstructive sleep apnea was a significant risk factor for heart disease and high blood pressure. And a lot of other studies now have demonstrated that insomnia, for example, is at increased risk of heart disease, and there's data that indicate that restless legs is associated with heart disease. So poor sleep is probably not good for heart disease and also for diabetes. Um, here's one. I'm not sure I know quite the answer to this, but uh, the question is, does having mono in high school alter your sleep cycle for the rest of your life? I would, the answer to that is, is, is most likely not. Um, there, now, there is a little controversy, I would say, here, because some people would believe that mono is a risk factor for chronic fatigue syndrome, which uh, has never actually been demonstrated that it is. But if you believe that, people who, do, who have chronic fatigue syndrome do have sleep problems. And so if you make that connection, you would say yes, but basically not. Um, so I'm going to ask, while well, you're figuring out the next one you want to do. So question is, so what happens if you can't get a full eight hours of sleep in a row, but you sleep in parts? Uh, naps every few hours that still equal eight hours or more. That's an excellent question. And part of that would depend on why you think you need sleep. So in terms of performance, if you get around eight hours of sleep divided over time, it may be true that your performance is fine, <coughs> but we have no idea about metabolic effects, cardiovascular effects, learning effects, immune effects. We don't know for those studies, for those particular physiologic effects, whether if you get a number of short sleeps, it has the same effect as a one long consolidated sleep episode. Once again, as I said in the beginning, sleep in some ways is not evolutionarily, it seems like it would be evolutionarily not optimal to be immobile for eight hours. And so presumably some physiology benefits from this long extended period of relative quiescence and not just because you can't see your enemy in the middle of the night. Um, thoughts on melatonin, Dr. Kwan or Dr. Redline? Well, I think that um, melatonin is, you can buy it in a health food store. Many people use it as a sleep aid. It's never been demonstrated to be a good hypnotic. That is a drug that will help you induce sleep. Um, the uses for melatonin that I use it for are people with circadian rhythm disorders, that there is some evidence they potentially may be useful for that. And that, that, that basically is what I use melatonin for. There's nothing inherently wrong with it. You can take melatonin in doses, in what we call pharmacologic doses, meaning it's far in excess of what you actually would need physiologically. It, it's not harmful, basically, but to use it as a sleep aid because you can't get to sleep in the absence of a cir circadian rhythm problem is probably not going to be useful. So in, by circadian rhythm problem, he means jet lag. So the way, so as he just said, if you can't get to sleep at your normal time and your body's on its regular schedule, there's no evidence that melatonin works. It's if you've just flown to San Francisco or Hawaii and your body clock is saying it's time to stay awake and you're trying to go to sleep, that melatonin has been shown to be effective. I'd also like to point out that melatonin is not regulated by the FDA and so you have to worry a little about purity and potency. Make sure that you get what you think you're getting in the pill and there's nothing else in that pill that shouldn't be there. But, but if you use it for jet lag or I use it for, you know, if I think a person has delayed sleep phase syndrome, um, the timing of, the, of when you take the drug actually is kind of important. You just kind of can't take it at any time. So you, if you're contemplating that, you might want to see one of us before you go and do it. Yes, <laughs> and to have, an, to have some is sort effect. Of like an extended teenager, the person who goes to sleep at 2 o'clock in the morning and can't get up before 10 or 11, that's delayed sleep phase syndrome. There's an, another area that is um, being investigated in our group at Harvard has been, the, actually there are some drugs including some beta blockers used for hypertension that depress your body's own melatonin secretion and one of our colleagues is now investigating that that may be a population um, that may benefit from melatonin supplementation and improving sleep duration, but it's actually, you know, again, a situation where their own intrinsic melatonin levels are be, are being depressed by another medication. But that's very interesting research. It's not definitive, but there'll be more to come on maybe those special situations. So um, one question here I think we 
probably ought to address because we've just been mainly talking about adults is uh, how many hours of sleep do teenagers and children need? Well, the, the one a, a very simple answer is they all need more than what we get as an adult. I mean, if you look at the sleep needs throughout the lifespan, it kind of goes like this where you know, you have infants up here who basically only do two things in, in life, um, and both start with S, sleep, sleep and something else. We won't go into the S, something else. And then as they, as they get older, you know, they, they, they tend to sleep more through the night, and then they consolidate their sleep, and they need less naps. And then as, as they get older, they need less and less sleep. But even a teenager probably needs nine to 10 hours of sleep at night. And that's one of the problems actually in society today is that when teenagers, the school bus comes at about 7 a.m. in the morning. 6.45 in my district. Okay, 6.45. And at that point in time, it's, it's too early for them because number one, they have a slightly physiologic delayed sleep phase. Teenagers don't wanna go to sleep at 10 o'clock at night, they may want to go to sleep more at 12 midnight. And so, but of course, for a variety of reasons, not to mention using their cell phones or texting or their iPad or TV or whatever, or just talking on the phone, they won't actually, they'll stay up way past that. And then of course the bus comes at 6.45 and, and then they have to at least get up at least half hour to an hour before then. And you can see that the whole sleep time has been constricted. So it's no wonder that they actually fall asleep in first period or second period. And that the few school districts that have actually addressed this problem by changing the school start times have demonstrated that children, they have less mental health problems, they do better in school, and they're happier. And it seems like a no-brainer that you would do it, but <clears throat> it's amazing how something like changing school start times is, becomes a basically a federal case if you try to do it. So on that happy note, we're going to encourage you all to go out and do something and then go to sleep early. Thank you very much for coming and for your attention.